Hello and welcome to week four of our eight-week study on praying with the Gospel of John. Uh, this week we'll be looking at a theme that's uh, prominent in John's Gospel, and that is the theme of laying down one's life for another. And we'll begin with John 10, the uh, parable of the Good Shepherd. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. O God, whose Son Jesus is the Good Shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. So if you have your Bibles uh, handy and could turn to John chapter 10. You'll, uh, you'll remember that we said that John's gospel is a gospel of love. John's spirituality is bathed in love. John says God is love. God's very nature, God's very character is love. And he says that God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that those who might believe in him could have everlasting life. Uh, so God is love. God sends the Son into the world to reveal God's love to us and to uh, show us that God desires to be in relationship with us. And in this gospel, we see Jesus intimately bound to the one that he calls his father uh, in a relationship of love. He says, uh, the father loves me and, and I love the father. The father abides in me and I abide in him. So there's this intimate connection or communion between the son and the father in John's gospel. So, so much so that everything that he does, everything he does, everything he says, flows out of this intimate connection that he has with God. And then he invites us to be in this kind of intimate relationship with him. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you. And uh, love me as I have loved you. And so he invites us into a relationship of love with himself. And he encourages us to be loving toward one another. A new commandment, he says, I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. So the theme of love uh, permeates this gospel and the, the letters of John, which come from the same uh, Johannine community. Uh, so love is the theme. And one of the most uh, powerful images of that love is the image of the Good Shepherd which Jesus uses to describe himself in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. John 10 actually contains a series of parables about shepherds and sheep. And, uh, and so we have to be careful not to push them all together or we'll get some things that don't seem to make sense. So let's look at them just segment by segment to see uh, what he's what he's talking about. The, the concept of shepherd and sheep uh, is not a new one in the New Testament or not a new one for John. This, uh, this imagery is widely used in the Old Testament. Many of us grew up learning Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. So God is compared to a shepherd who leads his flock uh, to green pastures and, and Let's them lie down beside still waters. So that image of God as shepherd uh, is prominent uh, throughout uh, uh, the Old Testament. Uh, also, in some places, um, the religious leaders are called shepherds of the people. And so uh, sometimes God berates them for being bad shepherds, for not taking good care of the flock. But uh, that symbol is also used not just for God, but for, for um, 
the people whom God appoints to be uh, leaders and caretakers for the people. Now that the uh, the theme of shepherds and sheep is taken up again in the New Testament in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We have a number of parables that are uh, uh, based on this this metaphor. Uh, other New Testament writers uh, in, the, in some of the letters, the later letters, use the image of shepherd to talk about those human beings that are uh, uh, caring for the believing congregation. And so um, uh, that image is used uh, for human leaders in the church. But John's, uh, John's focus is on using that uh, here for Jesus. Jesus is the model good shepherd. And uh, while he does call other people to the task of shepherding uh, in the body of Christ, uh, Jesus himself is the main shepherd, the good shepherd. So the first, let's look at the first five verses of John chapter 10. And here John is uh, drawing a contrast between the shepherd and between thieves. These thieves enter the sheepfold, not through the gate, but they climb over the walls and uh, um, they do so to uh, steal the sheep. So thieves and bandits are contrasted with the shepherd. The, the shepherd can enter the gate and the gatekeeper recognizes his voice and opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his sheep by name, and he leads them out. He goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow them because they know his voice. And they will follow him, but they won't follow strangers because they don't recognize the voice of the strangers. So Jesus is comparing himself to a shepherd who is known by his sheep and who knows his sheep and who is able, therefore, to lead them as contrasted to false shepherds and thieves and bandits who climb over the walls, don't enter in through the gate, uh, but climb over uh, into the uh, sheepfold in order to steal. And uh, this, of course, is uh, how Jesus is portraying uh, some of the religious leaders of his day. Now, after he makes this, uh, this analogy, uh, verse 6 tells us Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So now we have a second uh, uh, parable, and this one, in this one, Jesus uh, likens himself to the gate. And he says, I am the gate for the sheep. Uh, now, if the gate uh, has a has the potential of opening and closing, obviously, and allowing sheep to come in or to go out. So he is in control of uh, uh, who comes in and who goes out. And that includes the shepherd. Remember from the first section, the gatekeeper recognizes the voice of the shepherd and allows him to come in through the gates to lead out the sheep. So all who came before me, Jesus says in verse 8, are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. So Jesus is saying that uh, both for the sheep, he is the point of entry. And the new life that he is bringing, he is the point of entry into this new life. And so he uh, likens himself to the gate, which can swing open so that people can come in. He also controls the shepherds. And so he allows the good shepherds to come in through the gate, but he will, uh, he will not allow strangers and thieves and bandits uh, to come in. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they might have life and have it abundantly, Jesus says in verse 10. Then uh, there's a third parable here, starting in verse 11. 
I am the good shepherd. And here Jesus is talking about what a model shepherd is. And he says two important things about this model shepherd. Uh, the good shepherd is the one who is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. The hireling, someone who is just hired to do the job temporarily, doesn't care for the sheep. And doesn't, uh, and so he's unwilling to risk his life uh, for their well-being. And so, when a wolf comes or a threat poses itself, uh, the the hireling runs away uh, because he doesn't love the sheep in the same way that the good shepherd does. But the good shepherd is the one who cares enough to risk his own life to defend his sheep. So that's the first quality of the Good Shepherd. He's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And the second is that he knows his sheep. The sheep recognize his voice. He knows them. He calls them by name. He's able to lead them out. He's able to correct them and to, and to direct them uh, by knowing their name. So here we have an image of that kind of intimate relationship. Uh, with Jesus, and Jesus knows each of us by name, and he calls each of us by name. He invites us to uh, listen for his voice and to respond and to follow him when we hear his voice. So there's this intimate relationship between the shepherd and the sheep that he's using as a model for the relationship that he wants to have with those of us who choose to follow him. And this love uh, that he has for his sheep uh, go beyond just his own sheep uh, in an interesting uh, uh, twist here in verse 16 it says I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock one shepherd now, we're not exactly sure what he's referring to here by other sheep, but uh, one, uh, one possibility is that he's referring to his flock as, as this Johannine community from which this gospel comes. And he's saying, I have other sheep, uh, other churches that have been established, other uh, gatherings of uh, Christians. Uh, for example, the Petrine communities under, under Peter's leadership, who, who also belong to him. So that could be one meaning that he's going beyond just this group of Christians who uh, are uh, responsible for this gospel and welcoming other groups as well. Or it could mean something even broader than that, that he uh, has sheep in other folds. Uh, so we're not exactly sure what it means, but he's uh, he is gathering all of them into one flock, all those who believe in him, who follow him, uh, who belong to him, are to be gathered into one flock. For this reason the Father loves me, he says, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. We're going to see this pattern throughout the remaining chapters of John's Gospel where we watch Jesus go uh, to his arrest and uh, through uh, the trial before the high priest and the trial before Pilate and then to his crucifixion. We're going to see him in this Gospel portrayed as going readily and willingly to his death. So he em em he seems to embrace the path that he's on with its, with its deadly consequences. Uh, but it's clear to John that no one is taking his life from him. He's not a victim of the Romans or he's not a victim of the Jewish leaders. He is the good shepherd who's willingly laying down his life for the good and the benefit of his sheep. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. And I have received this command from my Father. So in obedience to the Father, he is willing to put his life on the line for the sheep. 
Now, once again, his words cause a division among the hearers. And we've seen this all through the gospel. Some accept these words and others reject these words. In this case, uh, Jesus says, uh, uh, referring to the Jews, they do not believe because they do not belong to his sheep. His sheep hear his voice. They know him. They follow him. And uh, they will not be taken away from him. Uh, they'll not be snatched away because the Father is with him. And indeed, the Father and I are one, Jesus says. So because he belongs to God and because God has given him these sheep uh, to care for, they will not be taken away from him. The Jews are ready here at the end, toward the end of this uh, section in verses 31 to 33. Uh, the Jews, and remember we, we specified these Jews as, as, as a group of, of opponents who are working against Jesus. It's not all Jews or even all the Jews that were uh, present in Jesus' day. It is uh, simply this group of opponents. And he says, these opponents, these Jews are ready to stone him for blasphemy. But Jesus tell, uh, uh, tells them to judge him on the basis of his works, uh, which flow from his uh, union with the Father and his communion with the Father. So they try to arrest him, but he escapes. Now, we, after this, uh, John chapter 10, in which this uh, image is expounded, we had John chapter 11, which is the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, which we talked about in week three of our series. It's the final sign of a series of seven signs that John gives us in the book of signs. And it is the one where we see uh, uh, the, his opponents uh, turning against him. Uh, and in John chapter 12, then, after Jesus has uh, raised Lazarus from the dead, he returns to Bethany at a later point. And at this time, he's visiting Lazarus, who has been raised uh, and is uh, and now living again with his uh, sisters. He visits Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and at this point, Mary anoints his feet with an expensive ointment. And he does, she does so, uh, Jesus says, as a preparation for his burial. He, she anoints his feet with a costly perfume and wipes them with her hair. And Jesus indicates that this is an appropriate act because it's preparing him for, for, um, for burial. Uh, then there follows the next day, as it says, uh, a procession into Jerusalem. Remember, Bethany is just a town just just over the the hills of the Mount of Olives, and so it was a short walk into Jerusalem and up to the the Temple Mount. And so, as Jesus comes over that hill and and uh, enters into the city, uh, riding on a donkey which was a fulfillment of, of, of uh, the Old Testament prophecy. So we have this procession uh, into Jerusalem with palm branches, with shouts of Hosanna, and Jesus riding into the city seated on a donkey. And we hear now, uh, for the first time, uh, the, the phrase, the hour is come. The hour is now here. A group of uh, Greeks come to Jesus. They want to see Jesus, and they approach his disciples about seeing Jesus. And this, for Jesus, seems to be a sign of uh, uh, that God's salvation will extend beyond uh, the Jews, beyond Israel. And uh, so he says, "His hour has come," and then he uses uh, uh, the image of a seed falling into the ground and dying. And he says this seed has to fall into the ground and die before it can actually produce fruit. And uh, if, it, if it doesn't die, it will remain just a seed. A seed. And so he's, he's using all of this imagery, the imagery of the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, 
um, the imagery of the anointing with the oil for burial, and now his, his words about the seeds needing to fall into the ground to die in order for fruit to come forth. He's using all of these to prepare his disciples and uh, his audience for, his, uh, for the turn that's about to come where he begins his journey of, of uh, bringing glory to God and revealing the glory of God through his arrest, uh, trials, crucifixion, and resurrection. So he's beginning his return to the Father here. And uh, he does so by giving us these uh, number of images of, of his death. We don't have in John's Gospel, in John's Gospel, I just said Jesus is kind of in charge of this whole process. He goes willingly to, to the garden to be arrested, and, and he, uh, he's, he doesn't uh, fight uh, back. He doesn't uh, resist uh, Pilate or the high priest. Uh, um, he's, he's willing to go along with this process. He's voluntarily laying down his life for the sheep. It's, his life is not being taken away from him. So we don't have in John uh, a Gethsemane scene where Jesus is uh, pleading with the Father for this cup to pass by him if possible. We don't see that kind of Jesus who might be uh, afraid or uh, might be uh, 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 trembling in the hour before he knows he's going to be arrested. This Jesus, other than just this uh, one suggestion in verse 27, he says, now my soul is troubled. But that's all of Gethsemane that we're going to see here in this gospel. Now my soul is troubled. But then he answers himself immediately. And now what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, he says, He's, he has a, a comeback for, for this question. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And so uh, Jesus beginning the path of glory, and we're going to move now into the book of glory, which chronicles his journey through the last week of his life and on to his crucifixion and resurrection. When I am lifted up from the earth, he says, I will draw all people to myself. And so this is the very reason why he's come. He's being lifted up so that he can draw all people to himself. So in the fourth gospel, Jesus is never a victim. He's not a victim of the Romans or of the Jews. The author wants us to know that his life was not taken from him, but that he laid it down of his own accord. Just like the hired hand doesn't, uh, won't risk his life for the sheep, but Jesus is the good shepherd who willingly lays down his life for the sheep. And for this reason, he says, the Father loves him. No one takes it from me, he says, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. And we'll watch this attitude, uh, this stance of willingly going forward toward his, his own death, uh, carry on through, uh, throughout the Passion narrative. Um, at the end of John uh, chapter 12, we still uh, read of the resistance. John chapter 12, verse 37. Although he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. And this was to fulfill the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah, says John, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. So uh, there is still at this point, even in spite of the many signs that have been given, there is still resistance and uh, a lack of belief. Uh, not everyone is coming uh, to faith in Jesus. Now we turn to chapter 13, and as we pointed out in an earlier talk, it opens up 
with uh, this begins the, the section called the Book of Glory. It opens up with the account of the Last Supper. And John's account of the Last Supper is different from the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see Jesus taking up bread and wine and, uh, and comparing them to his own body and his blood, his body which will be broken on the, on the cross and his blood which will be shed on the cross. Uh, he takes this bread and breaks it and he pours out the wine as a symbol of his, his own suffering and death. John doesn't have any, uh, anything to say about that here in the scene in the Last Supper where we would expect it. And he doesn't have the words of institution for the Last, uh, for the last Supper or for the communion in which Jesus says, this is my body. Uh, do this for the remembrance of me, and this is my blood, and drink this for the remembrance of me. And those words are absent as well. So we find those in Matthew and in Luke and in Mark. There's reference to, to this, uh, this bread and wine, but not in John. John's focus is instead on the foot washing. Jesus, uh, 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 opening up chapter 13, says, now, before the festival of the, of the Passover, and just a note about this, this is another difference between Jesus in John's Gospel and in the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels have the last meal as a Passover meal. In John's Gospel, it happens before the Passover begins. So it's the night before the Passover begins, or Thursday night, and... Uh, 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 Jesus, Jesus is celebrating a meal with his disciples. It's not a Passover meal, but it has some of those uh, same tones in it. For example, he dips the bread and, uh, in the cup, and that's a, a reminder of the dipping of bitter herbs uh, during the uh, Passover meal. So there are some allusions to Passover, but it's not technically a Passover meal. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And so here, we, Satan is blamed, the devil is blamed for the change of heart within Judas Iscariot that allows him to betray Jesus, which we will see coming up um, at the Last Supper and at the arrest of Jesus. During the supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God, and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself, and he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. This is the focal point for the Last Supper in John's Gospel. And it's not a scene that we find in any of the other Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have no mention of this foot washing. But it is unique to John, and it replaces, or it seems to be the focus which overshadows the, the uh, symbolism of the bread and wine. So yeah, Jesus begins to wash his uh, disciples' feet. This is a scene that we're very familiar with. When he comes to Peter, Peter is so uh, shocked and horrified by this utter humiliation of Jesus, taking on the role of a servant. And at Jesus' day, uh, Jewish slaves were not even permitted to wash the feet of, of guests coming into the house. And so this, was a, this was a task reserved for the lowest of the low. 
And so uh, for Jesus to take on this task himself is horrifying to Peter and to the other disciples. And Peter protests, he won't allow Jesus to wash his feet in this way. Now Jesus uh, overcomes his, his, his protest by claiming he, he has to ha undergo this. He has to, uh, has to be washed. This word uh, wash um, is, uh, is the word that is used uh, to refer to baptism in the New Testament. And so we see here an allusion to baptism. This is something more than just a lesson in humility and in service, although it is that. And Jesus will, will point out in just a few verses that it is that. He's trying to teach humility and service, uh, the laying down of one's life. He's trying to model it for his disciples. But it's more than that, because when Peter objects, Jesus says, no, you have to be washed. And, and Peter says, well, wash me entirely then. I had to foot wash me. But uh, and Jesus says, no, it's not necessary. Uh, if, you, if you've been washed, you're clean. You don't need to be washed again. And so this, uh, this reflects more the understanding of the early church and the early church fathers of uh, that once someone was baptized, they didn't have to be re-baptized. So if a person who had been baptized fell into sin, they needed simply to confess that sin and be forgiven and restored to the fellowship of the, of the body. They didn't have to go through baptism again. And so here we have this uh, being being spoken of symbolically here in this interchange between Jesus and Peter. After uh, Jesus washes their feet, he points out to them uh, that this is a lesson for them. Uh, so in verse 17 of chapter 13, Jesus says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And earlier in, chapter, in verse 15, uh, or 14, uh, so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So he is, uh, he's giving, uh, he's modeling a behavior, he's giving uh, um, the basis for his, his call to them. And he, as the Good Shepherd, is going to lay down his life for the sheep, but he also expects them to engage in the same kind of generous uh, service, to lay down their lives for one another and to uh, embrace the same kind of humility and service that he demonstrates here in the foot washing. So I have washed your feet and have given you an example, and you are to wash one another's feet. The, the meal uh, then progresses to a scene where there's a conversation. And here is an interesting uh, difference of John uh, with the other Gospels. Uh, as we said, the foot washing is unique to John and it's prominent to, uh, to John's uh, telling of the Last Supper. But also prominent are the roles of uh, Peter and of the beloved disciple. This beloved disciple is an unnamed disciple. is simply referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's not given a name, and he appears a half a dozen times uh, at key junctures from here on in the story. He hasn't appeared yet, at least not explicitly. There's some belief among scholars that perhaps uh, the, the early uh, follower uh, who came from John, a follower of John the Baptist, who came at Jesus' invitation in chapter one to follow Jesus, might have been this beloved disciple. But it doesn't say explicitly there that this was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so we're not sure if that was his call or not. But this disciple has a particularly close and intimate relationship with Jesus. The disciple whom Jesus loved. 
And uh, does that mean that uh, Jesus has favorites? <laughs> Doesn't he love all of this disciples? And, and of course he does, but he's, he's, he's entered into human reality here. And the human reality is that we have concentric circles of people that we know. And uh, we have a small set of circle uh, of people who we're intimate with, who we can share our deepest secrets or hopes or fears with. Uh, and then we have a wider circle of friends that we uh, get together with and whose company we enjoy, but we don't, uh, we don't grant them access to our inner lives quite as regularly. And then there are a wider circle still of acquaintances and then people that we meet in day-to-day -day life who are, we don't really call friends or even acquaintances, but who, who we know and we interact with in some ways. So those concentric circles are true in any, uh, in any person's life, and Jesus uh, had the same thing. In the Synoptic Gospels, it seems to be James and John and Peter who form a kind of a, an inner circle. And when Jesus goes up, for example, on the Mount of Transfiguration, these are the three disciples he chooses to, to invite to come with him. But in John's Gospel, there is this unknown disciple, this nameless disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who appears at several junctures in the latter part of John's Gospel. And this is the first time that he appears in John chapter 13. Uh, Jesus is at the supper now with his friends uh, and uh, seated next to him or reclining next to him. If we picture this in our mind, we have to picture the guests at this meal, Jesus and his disciples, uh, lying on the, on the ground on their left side and using their elbows to prop up their heads uh, and, and then reaching for the food with their right hands, uh, which is put before them by, by servants. So we have them lined up next to each other. So Jesus would be here and the, and the beloved disciple next to him in a way that he could lean back and rest on Jesus' uh, breast. So this image of, uh, of intimacy and of closeness of this disciple whom he loved in, immediately next to him and reclining against his breast. And notice there's a conversation. You know, uh, Jesus says, someone is going to betray me. And the disciples, of course, want to know who it is. So Peter, who seems to be farther down the line, signals to the disciple whom Jesus loved, who's lying right next to Jesus. He says, eh ask him who it is. You know, we can imagine this kind of whispered um, urgency to ask him to name who it is, who's going to betray him. And then uh, the beloved disciple asks Jesus, and Jesus says, it's the one to whom I give this piece of bread, which I'm going to dip in the bowl and, and hand up to him. Um, and so uh, John, we can picture John kind of whispering back as the one that he's going to give the bread to. So there's this exchange. Peter is slightly outside, and it's the beloved disciple who is the intimate uh, companion right next to Jesus at the last meal. So uh, the dialogue comes. Uh, Jesus knows he is going to be betrayed. He knows who his betrayer is, and he dips the bread um, and then gives it to Judas. And uh, he says to Judas, and here again, Jesus is in control of this whole process. He's going willingly to his death. He doesn't try to stop Judas or uh, to, to argue with him. Instead, he says, after, after, uh, after Jesus had given him the piece of bread, Satan entered into Judas. And uh, Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. So in fact, he kind of sends him out. Uh, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him to buy something, what they needed for the festival, or to give something to the poor. Uh, so that they weren't uh, clear. And then notice what John says. Uh, he immediately went out. And John adds, and it was night. 
And once again, this contrast between the light and darkness, between day and night in John's Gospel. And the night is a time uh, for evil and for unbelief and for uncertainty. And, um, and so Judas goes out into the night. And then Jesus uh, turns to his disciples and says, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. And uh, this movement of glory now begins as he progresses to his, uh, to his crucifixion. Jesus' revelation here of his imminent departure to his disciples is a tender moment uh, at this meal and uh, a sorrowful moment for his disciples. Um, as a final gift to them, he gives them a new commandment to love one another as he has loved them. In, in Latin, the word for commandment uh, is um, mandatu, which is uh, the same, uh, the root of the word that gives us Monday Thursday. Um, Monday, uh, deriving from the Latin word mandatum for commandment. So Jesus gives a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. And this new commandment is given at the Last Supper uh, to his disciples. So we have the, the title Monday Thursday or Commandment Thursday where, where the disciples receive this new commandment to love one another. Um, Peter uh, responds with a kind of reckless promise to lay down his life, which uh, reveals his good heart and his willingness uh, to be a good shepherd like Jesus. But we know that uh, uh, this very night that he makes this promise, he will fail in that uh, duty. Although ultimately um, he will become a shepherd of, uh, of Jesus' followers. So we're, we're going to close there for today. Next week, we're going to just pause a little bit on this journey toward uh, the crucifixion in order to take a closer look at the I am sayings in John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, there are a series of sayings that begin with I am. Uh, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. Uh, and we're going to look more closely at the meaning of uh, some of those and uh, use them as an invitation into prayer. So uh, there is, uh, for those of you who are following online now, uh, we will not have a, uh, a teaching or a class next week, uh, Tuesday, because of a scheduling conflict for the brothers. But we will meet again in two weeks, two weeks from tonight, uh, for that discussion on the I Am sayings in John's Gospel. And then from there, the following, the last three weeks of the program will focus on Jesus' arrest and crucifixion and resurrection. Thank you again for joining us, and uh, God bless you as you uh, live and pray with the Gospel of John during this season of Lent.